Let me start with a question. Why is infective endocarditis so difficult to diagnose, and why is the diagnosis often delayed? Before answering these questions, let's begin with a case of the cardiologist I mentioned in the first session. He was 62 years old at the time, a professor of cardiology. He presented with the chief complaint of severe fatigue for seven days. Three weeks prior to admission, he noted a tooth that was decayed and loose. However, he didn't have time to go to the dentist. Two weeks prior to admission, he flew to Europe for a cardiology conference and began experiencing low-grade fever with, without chills. One week prior to admission, he began experiencing fatigue. He complained that he just didn't have his usual energy. And on the day prior to admission, he noted that during his return flight from Europe, his fatigue had become so severe he had trouble walking off the plane. This problem prompted him to seek uh, primary, see his primary care physician. On physical exam, his temperature was 100.6 Fahrenheit, pulse was 85, and his blood pressure was 120 over 80. He was cheerful, but did, not, but did appear chronically ill. HENT and eye exam revealed splenal hemorrhages on, the, on his conjunctiva. The fundi revealed no hemorrhages. The lungs were clear. Heart exam, a two over six holosystolic murmur heard along the left sternal border radiating to, radiating to the axilla. His abdomen, no hepatosplenomegaly was appreciated. Extremities, all pulses were two plus. A splinter hemorrhage was noted under the nail of his right index finger. He also had a tender red nodule on the sole of his left foot. Laboratory data included a hematocrit of 30, a hemoglobin of 10, normochromic, normocytic anemia. A white cell count was 8,000 with a normal differential. His C-reactor protein was 110, markedly elevated. His urinalysis revealed 60 red cells and a mild increase in protein. This is called microscopic hematuria. Bud cultures, three out of three, drawn uh, 15 minutes apart, grew strep viridans. Cardiac echo revealed several vegetations on his mitral valve and moderate mitral regurgitation. Our cardiologist had the symptoms for about two weeks. Most individuals experienced symptoms for four to five weeks before the diagnosis is made. When a dental procedure precedes the onset of disease, the incubation period from the time of the presumed bacteremia to symptoms is usually less than two weeks. Our patient had two of the most common symptoms of patients with endocarditis, fever and fatigue. As shown on this slide, fever is the most common complaint, noted in 80% of patients, while fatigue is noted by 40% of patients. Chills are another common complaint. Other symptoms include sweats, anorexia, weight loss, malaise, and cough. Arthralgias, myalgias, and back pain can also be complaints. As you can see, all of these symptoms are relatively nonspecific, explaining the frequent delay in diagnosis. Infective endocarditis can mimic many other diseases and needs to be included in the differential of all patients who have fever without localizing complaints. A comment about back pain. There have been a number of patients who have presented with back pain and fever, distracting the clinician from considering endocarditis. In addition to vertebral osteomyelitis, beware of the possibility of endocarditis. Exactly why some patients complain of back pain is unclear. Possibly, this is a consequence of muscle irritation or inflammation. Physical findings can be helpful, but may be missed if not carefully looked for. Fever is present in nearly all cases, as is a heart murmur. If you fail to hear a heart murmur, you should question the diagnosis of endocarditis. There are two exceptions to this rule. One, the patient with right-sided endocarditis 
because the tricuspid regurgitation murmur can be relatively soft in volume. And two, patients with prosthetic valve endocarditis or endocarditis initially may not have a change in heart sounds. A thorough physical exam often reveals embolic phenomena and some of the skin manifestations of these small infected emboli include splinters and petechiae, Janeway lesions, and Oser's nodes. Our patient had two splinter hemorrhages in his conjunctiva and under his fingernail and an Oser's node on the sole of one foot. Splenomegaly, clubbing, and retinal lesions may also be seen. Here is an example of a splinter hemorrhage in the conjunctiva. And here is an example of a retinal hemorrhage. This is a classic raw spot. Note the central area of clearing appearing like a donut. Here are some examples of nail bed splinter hemorrhages, similar to the ones seen in our cardiologist's index finger. Janeway lesions are small areas of infarction and hemorrhage as shown on this toe. In this final image, you can see both a Janeway lesion and an Oser's node. Oser's nodes are emboli that have lodged deeper in the skin and are moderately erythematous, erythematous and are tender to touch. So now you know why we infectious disease specialists so carefully examine nail beds and peripheral extremities whenever we are considering the possibility of endocarditis. In the next video, we will be discussing how to make the diagnosis of endocarditis and how best to treat this potentially life-threatening infection. Thank you.